All right. Um, and anything you can write as a chemical reaction almost always is going to have a change in energy associated with it. Right, so in, in this case, if we're just talking about ice melting, we can represent it as solid H2O turns into liquid H2O. And anytime you've got a transition like that, where you, can, you have two different states on either side, or you've got a before and an after, there's always a temperature or there's always an energy change associated with that, right? And so that's, to for those of you who asked what enthalpy was or what delta H was, that's delta H, in general is always gonna be the change in internal bond energy between before and after, final minus initial, right? So anytime you have a change in, in phase like this, it's always gonna have an associated energy. And more typically, um, people tend to associate, um, tend to associate delta H with um, chemical reactions um, but phase changes work just as well. And the units also tell you how to, how to approach this, right? Because the units we get for, for um, water melting, this is 334 joules per gram. A lot of times, those of you, I think everybody in here has had a chemistry class before, right? And so knows more or less what a mole is, even if it feels a little rusty. More commonly, delta H values for reaction are going to be written as kilojoules per mole of reaction. We're starting, since we haven't defined moles in this class yet, we're starting just the easy way by saying joules per gram, but there's a value for delta H for of um, fusion for water that's in kilojoules per mole instead, right? So the fact that you have this delta H number, the fact that it's a phase change is what tells you you're not gonna use Q equals MCP delta T because you don't have a delta T associated with it you instead have a phase change. Um, which brings me to, there are a few other relevant questions I wanna go over and I'm gonna pull them up on the version of the slides that got updated since this one didn't get updated. Um, uh, somebody said, well, what's the difference between delta H of fusion or fusion when we're talking about phase change versus nuclear fusion? And then somebody else asked, asked about what is nuclear fission. So I can tackle both of those at the same time and they're relevant. In this case, fusion is being used specifically to mean going from a solid to a liquid or the other way around. Um, fusion, when we're talking about nuclear chemistry is, is when you literally get two atoms, two, the two nuclei so close together that they stick. We talked a little bit about how having those neutrons in the nucleus um, is is what causes the forces to sort of balance out and gives you a stable nucleus is in fact when you have the right number of neutrons compared to the right number of protons that becomes a stable nucleus um, that all happens because you wind up taking these two nuclei and if you shove them together fast enough and hard enough you can get them to fuse together so that's what happens in in particle accelerators to discover new atoms or new elements that's also what happens in the sun, right? The sun, most of the, the universe started out as either um, hydrogen, helium, or lithium after the Big Bang. Everything, but after that, the gravity pulls together all the hydrogen and a bunch of all of these other small atoms to the point that they, you got these clouds of, of small atoms, small nuclei, that got crushed together so tightly that they actually started fusing together. You got those nuclei so close that they stopped being separate nuclei. That's what nuclear fusion is. Um, if you've ever heard the phrase, yeah, um, somebody's probably said it before, um, we are all stardust. That's what that phrase comes from, is the idea that the fact that we live in a solar system that has elements heavier than lithium especially the fact that we live in a solar system with elements heavier than lead, um, means that we must be living in a, a second generation solar system. All of the elements that are heavier than lithium were made in a supernova or in the center of a star before our star formed, um, which is kind of cool. That's, that's why that phrase um, gets repeated so much and why it's, it's such a cool idea. 
is that every atom in your body was at one point part of a star um, before that, that then eventually went supernova. Um, fission is literally the exact opposite. If you happen to make a nucleus where you don't have the right number of neutrons balancing out protons, you wind up with that being an unstable nucleus and it te they tend to split apart. So that's what happens with, with materials that are naturally radioactive like uranium um, or, or anything heavier than lead 208 is there, they are, all have unstable nuclei that will, um, that will split. And I don't know the, the root of the term fission. Fusion kind of makes sense. You're fusing two things together. I don't know what fission takes its root from in terms of Latin or Greek or anything like that. But all it means, it's the exact opposite of fusion. Things split apart. It could be like, yeah, probably a similar route to fissure. Um, they call material that can undergo fission, they call it fissile material, F-I-S-S-I-L-E, material. Um, but that's really neither here nor there, but that kind of might give you some background into if, if any of you watched Oppenheimer over the summer. Did anybody watch Oppenheimer? Yes. I still haven't been able to see it. Um, but then again, Dune is one of my favorite books, and I still haven't seen the most recent Dune movie. So I'm just way behind. If you want to keep up on your movies, don't have kids. Um, it, they just wreaks havoc with going to the movie theater. And I don't want to see um, Dune anywhere that's not the movie theater. So I just keep waiting for them to bring it back you somewhere. I did watch Barbie. Wow. That one didn't require being in the movie theater. I did because I watched it with my seven-year-old. Not We didn't do the Barbenheimer thing. Um, but anyway, um, who plays uh, Feynman in Oppenheimer? I haven't looked at the cast list in a while. He's in there somewhere. Feynman, Richard Feynman. He was one of the really more junior people. He wasn't in the old guard. We'll talk about quantum today and we'll talk about the old guard of quantum um, and who was who. And because like, half of them wound up on the Manhattan Project. Um, but anyway, before that, um, how do we know why, how do we know temperature stays constant during a phase change? That seems like a big leap, right? Seems like it can't be perfectly well mixed. Um, the answer to that is, Basically, we know that it doesn't all happen at the same time or at the same temperature, but energy is what's called a state function. A state function just means it doesn't matter the path that it takes. All that matters is where it starts and where it ends. So elevation, like if you looked at change in elevation for driving from, from here to Carson City, your overall change in elevation doesn't matter which route you take, right? Your overall change in elevation just depends on where you start and where you end. That's what a state function is. And that's what energy is. Energy change for a process always doesn't matter at all what path you take. It just matters where you start and where you end, which means when we're choosing how to draw um, a particular process out, it can be really convenient to, to draw it as three distinct steps, like we do for our heating curves, right? Yeah, really, this is not a perfectly horizontal line. Really, as this happens, these corners are probably more rounded. It'll have a bit of a plateau, but then it'll keep going up. It might actually look something more like that if we actually timed this or if we measured this and watched it. Um, but it does, if you keep it well mixed, you actually can see it flatten out pretty well. And it doesn't really matter what these corners look like because the total Q, the total heat that we have to put in to get it to go through these changes, just depends on where it starts and where it ends, right? So it's convenient to say that everything, that it's perfect and treat it like there is perfect mixing and everything stays at exactly the right temperature. And if you can hold it at a phase change, like having a, a glass that has, is filled all the way up with ice and then you add some water to it, as long as you keep it relatively well mixed, everything's gonna stay the same temperature. If you don't let keep it well mixed, then it might not be exactly the same temperature top and bottom, but it'll be close. Which allows us, and the fact that it's a state function allows us to do make the math a lot easier by treating it like it's three distinct steps instead of all of them happening simultaneously. Um, 
somebody asked about um, if you're given the average mass of argon and are asked to find the number of protons, would you assume that the correct the correct um, operation is, or, or are we supposed to assume that the total number of mass in the middle is 40 or 39? And my answer to that is partly that if we're counting protons, it doesn't matter what isotope we're talking about, right? It doesn't matter what the mass number is if we're counting protons, because protons are defined by the fact that it said argon. So it doesn't matter what isotope you have, argon 39, argon 40. The number of protons per nucleus is the same. So what, based on the rest of this question that was asked, I think what they actually meant was, um, how do you count the number of neutrons if you're not given a specific isotope? And the answer is, you can take your best guess by rounding to the nearest whole number on the periodic table, um, but really you can't know for sure. If I'm asking you to count neutrons, I'm almost always going to give you a specific isotope so that you don't have to worry about that because you don't want to look at the periodic table and just guess what isotope we're talking about. You could do that and you could say something like, on average, it would be 22 neutrons, um, but it's better for the sake of this class if I just remember to give you the, that isotope, right? Which is now that we're getting into the part we're talking more about isotopes explicitly, um, I'll try to do a better job of that. When I first was just defining protons, I kind of ignored that um, for the sake of keeping things simple. Jay? So, yeah, typically if we're, if we're talking about experimentally or if we're talking about a really large number of atoms, you can treat it like your number of neutrons isn't a whole number necessarily. Your number of protons will still be a whole number, but your number of neutrons can be an average number. It's either 21 neutrons or 22 neutrons, but on average, it's gonna be 21.9 neutrons. Does that make sense? But if I'm asking about a specific atom or a specific nucleus, I'll do my best to make sure I always specify. And if you think I should have specified and I didn't, feel free to ask, even during a test. You're allowed to ask for clarification. I rewrite my tests every year so I can give you last year's tests as, um, as a practice test. But that also means that I have a lot of typos in my tests because I'm rewriting the questions every year. And there's a lot of times I'll forget something like that. So always feel free to ask um, for clarification or write that you're making an assumption like we did on that practice problem with the, with the can um, where I didn't give you the mass of water in the can. I said, oh, just write what your assumptions are. You can do that on a test too. Even if your assumptions are wrong, for whatever reason, you missed some detail that was in there, but you didn't see it. Um, that allows me to give you more partial credit, right? If you can just explain what your logic was and then you did the rest of the problem right or we're on the right track, I can still give you most of the credit for those. Does that make sense? Very rarely am I trying to trick you with a problem. I might ask really hard questions, but I'm not trying to trick you. I'm trying to give you everything you need. So if you think that there should be something there that's not, probably that's more oversight than me trying to be clever. All right. Um, any other questions about the quiz stuff? Like I said, scores are in there and I do try to an, um, answer your questions, um, your random questions at the end. Sometimes I'll just write in class, meaning that we'll talk about, I wanna talk about it in front of the whole group. Um, but, you, but if it's something that's more applicable just to you, um, then I'll just leave a note or as a comment on the quiz submission. So just go back and check those. Um, if, you, if I don't talk about your random quiz question or specific quiz question. But along the lines with random quiz questions, one quick thing, two quick things. Um, during class, you were talking about cooling mass down to zero Kelvin with lasers. Why would scientists put so much effort into doing that? Well, why do people count, climb Mount Everest? Because it's there, right? Because it's a challenge. What happens when we get things really, really cold? We don't know until we try it sometimes. That's how superconductors were discovered. Because turns out if you get things really, really cold, sometimes their properties change. They go through a phase change from one type of solid to another type of solid. Um, and you can make materials. Does anybody know what a superconductor is? 
So a semi can, an insulator is something that doesn't allow any current to pass, any electrical current to pass through it. Semiconductor allows current if you're above a certain voltage. Um, a conductor just allows current to pass through it. A superconductor allows current to pass through it with zero resistance. So effectively, it doesn't matter how long your cable is, you can get the same current and the same voltage at the beginning and end with absolutely zero energy lost as resistance, um, which has a lot of really big implications if you could make superconductors um, because it would, it would drastically change how we would wanna set things up in terms of um, like our power grid, for instance. We were able to come up with a superconductor that could be a superconductor at relatively warm temperatures. Um, then we could do something like have a giant solar farm in Arizona and ship the energy through superconductors all the way to New York City with zero loss and resistance. That's not plausible right now because every mile something travels through power lines, energy is lost. If we had superconductors, no energy would be lost. And then there's no practical limit to where we put our power supplies versus where we use it. Um, so why would scientists want to get things really, really cold? Let's see what happens. Maybe something weird will happen. Maybe there's another su a super superconductor. Um, or maybe you'll get things like, like, like uh, metallic hydrogen. Um, we don't really know until we try. So partly just because scientists are curious and want to know what's going on and see what happens. Um, and then along those same lines, the other random quiz question I'll talk about right now is talk is somebody brought up um, with the phase changes and the phase diagrams. Somebody brought up talking about how changing pressure can cause coal to turn into a diamond. That, and that's a perfect example of two different solid phases from the same material. Coal and, di and diamonds are literally both solid carbon, pure solid carbon. But if you change the pressure, if you increase the pressure on coal enough, then you can get that, that coal to turn into a diamond. Um, and that, so that is a perfect example of a liquid, liquid, or sorry, a solid, solid phase change. But uh, superconductors are another good example as well. All right. Any other questions about the quiz? The bee? He's on his leg. I don't mind spiders, but I don't like when they sneak up on me. So I feel you. All right, quick reminder, no quiz this weekend, which I didn't even plan this, but this works perfectly with homecoming this weekend, right? No quiz this weekend. You just have that, that counting protons and neutrons assignment from yesterday that's due on Sunday um, and study for the elements quiz. It's gonna be next Tuesday. All right. Any questions about that? Any other assignment questions from this week? Anybody want to go through the last problem on the on the energy one? Or did the key help enough? Or should we or should we do it number four? Four C specifically. Okay. Let me. Let me pull that up so we're all looking at that same assignment. Anybody who looked at the key, was everything I wrote in the key, did that more or less make sense? Was there anything I wrote that didn't make sense or you want to ask about what I meant? Because I tend to do the keys kind of, I try to explain things, but sometimes it's chicken scratch. Where was, Where was the key? Excellent question. Um, let me, so if, when you go to the homepage for, on Canvas, you get week one, week two, week three, right? If you click on week three, it had the link to all the assignments for this week. And it also had the link to key for, for homework three um, posted right there. Usually I try to remember to post it in the assignment itself as well. I forgot to do that this time, but um, yes, the key was posted in under week three. You should be able to see it. All right, let's look at 
what what measurement do you use for the can? So you do have to make an assumption about the mass of the can. The question tells you to assume that the soda has the same heat capacity as water. And since it doesn't say anything about the can itself, we can assume that the can's going to absorb very little of the energy. So we can just assume that's zero. But those are the two big assumptions. In addition to, we would need to look up mass. So um, you can either, if you happen to know that the, what the, um, how big a standard soda can is, you could use that. I just need you just needed to do something like assume assume mass of soda is equal to something. I'm going to pick 350 grams just because 335 is the standard. Um, 335 milliliters is the standard size, so mass of a soda is usually around 350 um, because that sugar adds some mass to it, as well as the other ingredients. So if we assume, we're gonna assume that. That doesn't matter for A and B though, right? For A, all we have to do is say, okay, well, look at, let's look at the system. We have the soda and then we have water forming little droplets. Those are water droplets, not, I don't know, they kind of look like zits or something. Um, you have water droplets forming on the outside of the can, right? This water on the outside of the can went from water is a gas to water is a liquid. So gas is our highest energy state. So if it went from gas to a liquid, the water on the outside of the can lost energy. And if the water on the outside of the can lost energy, where did it go? Into the can. So when water condenses, and the other way to think about this, if that's hard to wrap your head around, most people are, have experienced it. Um, when water evaporates off your skin, it cools you down, right? That's, that's kind of the whole point of sweat is that it cools you down because as the sweat evaporates off your skin, you're, you're doing the opposite of this process. It's liquid water going to a gas. And the energy to move it from a liquid to a gas has to come from somewhere. So it comes from, your, from the surroundings, comes from your skin. This is literally the exact opposite of sweat evaporating to cool you down. It's water condensing, which is gonna warm things up, right? And if you work through all the different steps, okay, well, this water lost energy or yeah, lost energy because it went from high energy to low energy and that energy had to go somewhere, therefore it must've gone into the soda. So the soda warms up. You can walk yourself through that logic every time, or you can think about it in terms of opposites. Like ice melting is a lot, is something we have a lot more experience with in everyday life than ice forming. Ice forming is a little trickier to wrap your head around conceptually, right? But as long as you know it's the exact opposite of ice melting, work your logic through for ice melting and then flip it. Um, so, in this case, for A, all you need to say is it warms the drink, all right? So if we're then trying to figure out how much it warms up the drink, part B asks how much energy changes hands. So if you have 6.512 grams of water and you have a delta H, you have an enthalpy effusion. Do you need something? Okay. Um, you can say, okay, well, 6.512 grams, and we use that number from earlier, that delta H of, of fusion. Um, except this is heat of condensation, so it's a different number. Heat of condensation is 2.26 kilojoules per gram. So every one gram of water that condenses is going to release 2.26, is that what I said? Yeah. And that's kilojoules of energy that the, the condensation loses to the surroundings. So you could write kilojoules lost or kilojoules released, um, however you wanna think about it. But getting our number is that simple because this is the grams of water that condensed and every water, one gram of water condenses releases 2.26 kilojoules. All right, so then for part C, 
it's it's a little bit like what we did in lab last week, except in lab last week, we said, OK, the copper is cooling down, the water is warming up. And we know that those two numbers must be the same, but opposite from each other, right? Whatever, however many grams or however many um, kilojoules of energy the water absorbed, that must be the same as what was lost by the uh, copper, right? We're doing the exact same thing here, except we have a, a phase change providing that energy instead of um, instead of just a hot thing touches a cold thing. All right, so once we know what this number is, which comes out to be what? 15-ish? 1.47 times 10 to the fourth. So that's converted to joules now already, right? Okay. That's gonna be the energy that's going into the soda. That's putting a number to our answer from part A. If that's the energy going into the soda, that's what we're gonna use for Q. One other person had on the quiz had the question, what is Q again? And remember <laughs> this was before, before we did these extra practice problems, right? So a lot of you were pretty hazy. If you think back to last Sunday, kind of a lot's happened since then um, when it turned in terms of practice problems. Q is the amount of energy that changes hands, so to speak, not literal hands, but you, you know what I mean. Um, and so Q, the amount of energy that goes into the soda is equal to the mass of the soda times the specific heat of the soda. Quick differentiation, just a reminder, specific heat is like the slope of the line. It's how much energy does it take to change the temperature per gram. Heat is the total amount. So it's a little bit like the difference between speed and distance. This is your slope, this is your total amount. And then times delta T. This question is asking, what is the final temperature? So we're trying to get delta T. We wanna know what the change in temperature is in order to find delta T we know specific heat because it tells us to assume 4.184. We know the mass because we made an assumption and we calculated Q in part B. So then it's just a matter of plugging in the numbers. 1.47 times 10 to the fourth joules equals 350 grams times 4.184 joules gram degrees per gram degree Celsius times delta T. I'm gonna wind up with what around 10? Is that about right? Yeah. 14,000 divided by something that's gonna be really close to 1400. Delta T is what? I'm I'm calling 10 pretty close to 9.5 for the sake of doing it in my head. Um, yes, 9.5 sounds great. How many sig figs do we get to keep? Three for now. Our delta T can be three sig figs because there's three sig figs there. If we assume this is three sig figs, so if you make this two sig figs, then you might only keep two sig figs. If you assume that your mass is plus or minus 10 grams instead of plus or minus one gram, which is probably a more reasonable assumption, given that we kind of made that number up out of thin air. Um, and then our specific heat has four sig figs. So either way, we're gonna wind up with something close to 9.5. Let's, let's go ahead and round it to two sig figs since yeah, that number probably is plus or minus 10 rather than plus or minus one. So two sig figs kind of makes sense. To get the final temperature, we just need to know where we started. And it says in, somewhere in there, a can of soda at one degree Celsius, buried in the beginning of B. So our final temperature 
is going to be 10.5 degrees Celsius. That's in Celsius. It asks for you to do it put in Fahrenheit. That's just, I won't call it busy work. It's practice so that you remember that we do sometimes have to convert to Fahrenheit. Um, and to make the point that this is actually a pretty big jump in temperature. What do we get for the final temperature in Fahrenheit? 51? 50.9. So think about what six grams of water looks like. It's not very much, right? It's halfway filling up one of those tiny graduated cylinders. Um, and so six grams of water on the outside of a can is enough to raise the temperature from freezing up to 50 degrees, which turns out, um, turns out water condensing on the outside of your can is the number one reason the Midwest uses beer koozies on everything in the summer, because they have a lot of humidity and your drink warms up very quickly. I saw a question. Was there a question over here first? I thought I saw him. Okay. Yeah. Good question. So if we know TF, one, we know from, from part A, we already worked through the logic, we should be getting warmer when this happens, right? The other way we can, we can think of this is T, delta T is equal to T final minus T initial, right? So 9.5 is equal to TF minus 1.0. So to solve for TF, you add the one. If you're unsure how to do that, writing out your change in temperature like this and plugging and actually doing the algebra is the way to make sure that you don't mix yourself up on adding versus subtracting those numbers. How are we feeling about this one now? Okay. The people that asked most strenuously to go through this one gave me thumbs up, so we're going to move on. If you still have questions about this, ask. Ask me, email me, stick around after class for a minute. Like a general rule is like you use like the Q equals MC changing time like most of the time, but not in a phase change. So in a phase change, you just do the like. Phase change or a chemical reaction, you don't have a delta T. Okay. And if delta T is zero, you can't use that equation. So yeah, so when there's a phase change, you're not going to use the Q equation. All right, who's ready to be done with, uh, with math problems for a couple minutes at least? Good. Um, I try to mix it up. I try to keep us on our toes with the math problems, but mix in these actual stuff as well. All right, has anybody ever seen this picture before? In black and white. This is the, uh, this is the colorized version. It wasn't actually taken in black and white. Or sorry, it was taken in black and white. Um, I think 1920, somebody went in by hand on Photoshop. So it's not actually the real, real colors. Um, yeah, colorized pictures are pretty cool. They do a pretty good job usually. All right. So this was from a conference. This is from one of the first conferences of its time or that we've ever had. Um, the early 1900s was really, really fascinating time in science history because up until about 1900, up until railways became really commonplace, um, there really wasn't a good way for people to live in different cities and still trade ideas back and forth. So you wound up before the 1900s, you wound up with, you know, this place, this physical location is, you know, where all of the research that's happening in physics is happening here mainly because it, it literally just took too much time to be able to communicate ideas. You literally had to write a note on a piece of paper, a letter on a piece of paper, send it in, on by post across the ocean on an ocean liner to get from the US to Europe, wait for somebody to read it, wait for them to respond to you, send it back. It was like a six month process to get feedback from one of your peers if they happen to be working in Germany, say, instead of in New York. 
Um, once we had railways and ocean liners um, and cars, it became a lot more feasible to bring all of the experts from an entire field worldwide into the same physical location. This is one of the first examples of this. I, I wanna say this was in 1927. Um, so in between World War I and World War II. Um, and again, if you saw Oppenheimer, some of these names might be familiar. Oppenheimer's not there. I knew it. Oppenheimer had already made his, his contributions at this point, um, but I believe he was already in America. This is primarily the European scientists because this, this conference was in a place called Solvay, which I believe is in Belgium. Um, it was in Western Europe either way. Um, every single one of those boxes is a Nobel Prize. The red ones in physics, the green ones in chemistry, um, the dotted lines, which are kind of hard to see. Um, that's, that's a guy who he did not himself win a Nobel Prize, but his immediate students did. So his protégés won a Nobel Prize. And at the top right. Um, so that's a lot, and considering the Nobel Prize had only been going on for, you know, maybe 30 years at this point, this is like better than half of the Nobel Prizes that had ever been awarded at that point in one place at the same time, which is kind of just really, really cool. And what they did is they just got together and they would present their research to each other during the day, and then they would argue about it, and then they'd go to the pub and they'd drink beer and they'd argue about it all night. And then they would go to bed and get up and somebody else would present their research the next, next day. Um, and so it was, it was really, really cool. Um, most everybody's gonna recognize Einstein right in the front. Um, but there's another, a bunch of other big names. Niels Bohr in particular is one of my favorites. Um, Heisenberg is right there. Heisenberg is funny because um, for whatever reason, I've never seen a picture of Werner Heisenberg where he didn't look like a creeper. He's like oh, always kind of like leaning forward, like, <laughs> like he's like sneaking, look around a corner or something. Every single picture I've ever seen of the guy. Um, I like Niels Bohr personally because Niels Bohr is the one who always had the, you know, Einstein had all of the clout already at this point. Um, and he didn't agree with a lot of the findings in quantum mechanics. He disagreed with some of the implications. So he just said, that can't be true because I don't like the way that that sounds. Um, and so he gets lots of, lots of uh, name recognition and has a lot of famous quotes like, God does not play with dice, was his objection to what's called the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, and Niels Bohr is my favorite because he's the one who always gets credited with having like the quippy retorts to Einstein. So Einstein says, God does not play with dice. And Niels Bohr says, Einstein quit telling God what to do. Um, so he always the one who was like primary antagonist. They were very good friends, um, but they argued a lot. Um, and I, I really like Niels Bohr as well because he was functionally illiterate. He's one of the, the founding fathers of quantum mechanics. And he literally had to dictate his thesis to his mom who typed it on a typewriter for him because he couldn't read. Um, what a guy. I, all these people, they're still just people, right? I really like a lot of the humanizing details. Um, for instance, this is well after Marie Curie's husband, Pierre. I think it was Pierre. It was something very, very like stereotypical French if it wasn't Pierre. I think it was Pierre. Um, he actually had already died. He didn't die from radiation poisoning like you might think. He actually was run over by a cart in the street in France, um, just crossing the road. All, <laughs> um, but uh, so Marie Curie actually had an on again, off again romance with um, Dirac. The Dirac? No, that's Lorenz. With uh, Lorenz, this guy with the white beard between Curie and Einstein. He was less of a physicist and more of a mathematician, but he and Curie had a relationship for most of their adult lives because Pierre died so young. Um, the other interesting thing I really love about Marie Curie is that there's something like two, three, four, five Nobel Prizes within two generations in her family because she won two. Pierre won one with her. Her oldest daughter won a one um, shared 
her second Nobel Prize with her mom. Um, and then her Marie Curie's second daughter, whose name escapes me, I think it's like Francine maybe, um, stayed behind when the rest of the Curie family was evacuated from France during World War II. They moved to the, to the US. Um, her younger daughter stayed behind as a member of the French resistance, which I mean, not a Nobel prize, but that's pretty badass. Um, she was a journalist by trade and she wound up marrying a guy who went on to become one of the founders of the UN post world World War II, who won a Nobel peace prize. So poor Francine or whatever her name was, I don't, can't even remember her name, um, wound up being surrounded by Nobel prizes. She never won one of her own, but um, she did fight in the French resistance. So that's something. All right. Um, is there anything else I wanted to get across here? Here's another good Niels Bohr quote. Those who are not shocked when they first come across quantum theory could not possibly have understood it. Um, the other good quote that I like to introduce quantum with is by Richard Feynman who is again, one of the younger minds on the Manhattan Project. He's in Oppenheimer, but I can't remember. He would have been a minor part because he was not one of the decision makers. Um, but he's the one who said, I think it's safe to say no one understands quantum mechanics. Uh, and he won a Nobel prize for his work on quantum mechanics and still feels like nobody really understands it. And part of that is because it basically one, runs counter to the way we perceive the world around us. Um, we're used to the idea that things can be here or there, but they can't be both at the same time. And basically our brains are hardwired, or you can think of it as our brain's firmware, this sort of preloaded into our brain when we're born, the way that we experience the universe around us is based around the macroscopic world, because that's the world we live in. And so we actually literally don't have any way of comprehending some of these quantum mechanics concepts. We can show them mathematically. We can try to come up with analogies to show, to explain how they work like Schrodinger's cat, but it's basically we're trying to get around the fact that our brains don't work that way and never will really. So that's what Feynman was getting at when he said, I think it's safe to say nobody understands quantum mechanics because we just don't have the tools. Um, we have the math, we can see the effects of it, but we just can't understand it. It just it runs counter to everything you experience in everyday life. All right, and normally I, I generally do this lab with, a, uh, um, with an electric guitar to demonstrate how different waves can be different energies, but you can't be in between the two energies. Um, I forgot that equipment at home. Um, so we're just going to have to, we're going to look at, let's see if this will actually load. Um, so this is a slow motion, over-exaggerated view of what a guitar string looks like when you, when you pluck it. Um, and really what's happening is you actually have a bunch of different waves sort of on top of each other at the same time. And the way that they overlap um, creates this sort of weird back and forth looking wave. It's actually not just one wave. It's a bunch of waves on top of each other. Um, what it actually looks like is gonna be something like all of these sort of put together. If you take all of these different waves on a guitar string and you overlap them at the same time, so this bottom one would just be string vibrating up and down, where the biggest part of the vibration is square in the middle of the string. But then there's another wave that it can exist at the same time that looks like there's no movement right in the middle, but it vibrates up and down on either side. Then there's another wave that has two spots where there's no vibration. And then there's three spots where there's no vibration. And if you take all of these different waves, which are called harmonics, you overlap them all together, you get something like that other, I'm gonna put it on the same, find it again. You get something that looks like the, our, our guitar string vibrating here. 
every time I go away from this tab, it wants me to subscribe. Um, so if you look at it just in terms of the harmonics, that's what they call the fundamental vibration is the biggest wave. Just goes back and forth. If you look at the next, the next harmonic, that's the one where it doesn't move at all in the middle, which is what they call a node, but it vibrates back and forth on either side. If you look at the third harmonic, that adds another node in the middle. And now we have even more vibrations. You notice as we keep doing this, they vibrate faster and faster. And we take all of these and we load them together and we get that overall shape going back and forth. All right, and so I want you to remember that when we start talking about electrons in a second. Um, but the, one of the points I'm trying to make here is that you can't have these waves just any length that you want. They can only exist at certain vibrations, certain energies, because if you think about a guitar string, the ends of a guitar string are fixed in space, right? The ends can't vibrate, right? Which means that you're limited as to what kind of vibrations you can actually have happen. Whatever kind of wave you have on a guitar string, it has to be connected to the same spot at both ends. Which means that there, there are fundamental um, rules that say you can only have a guitar string that vibrates at this frequency. It can be this frequency or it can be that frequency, but it can't be in between the two. And we can get in, in the real world, if you play an instrument, you can get around that by tightening the string or changing your string so it's not as thick. But in terms of if we're starting from this is our guitar string with its fixed properties, you can have this vibration or that vibration and nothing in between. And it turns out, um, Niels Bohr was the one who, who figured out that if you look at the wavelength of light that hydrogen emits, if you apply a voltage to hydrogen, like you make a fluorescent light bulb out of hydrogen gas, um, so like a cathode ray tube, like Thompson was using, um, it only glows at certain colors. The overall, the overall color looks kind of vaguely purplish, but it's really three, depending on how good your eyes are, maybe four wavelengths of light overlapping. And there's, it's not a continuous spectrum, like a rainbow. It's very specifically, let's see if I have, uh, you wind up with something that looks like this. No, I don't want to do that. I want. All right. Um, it looks kind of like a barcode. Instead of what would normally be a rainbow, you get something with only a couple values. So hydrogen. So, yeah, there's a good one. So, they started to figure this out when they started trying to apply quantum and trying to understand how electrons work. Hydrogen is the second line here. So a full spectrum looks like a rainbow. Hydrogen has four lines. And the reason I said three, maybe four, is because that one's so close to the UV that most people's eyes can't pick it up. Um, you know, your, your eyes kind of work a little bit like a bell curve. They get worse and worse at picking up things at the end of the spectrum. Um, and so with young eyes, if you are very careful and have good equipment, you might be able to see that line. My eyes, probably not. I, will probably, I would probably only be able to see three lines, regardless of how good the spectrum works, just because my eyes are physically older. Um, it's very similar to what happens with, with your hearing. You start to lose the edges of the spectrum before you lose hearing in the middle of the spectrum. Um, same is true with your eyes. Um, so Bohr looks at this and says, well, that must mean you can only have electrons at certain energy levels. That you can only have very specific energies for these electrons. Um, and the reason it applies to electrons is because they are starting to figure out that these electrons moving up and down in energy is what causes light to either be absorbed or emitted. 
Turns out you need electrons to generate light or to absorb light. And they started figuring out that you can move electrons between energy levels and you can watch what happens. And one of the things that happens when they move downhill in energy is that you start seeing these emission spectrums. Um, and so Bohr figured out, well, that must be because there's only certain harmonics that these electrons are allowed to be in. Just like the guitar string has very specific frequencies where you can find a vibration, you can't have a vibration that where the end is moving. So that limits your possibilities to only discrete numbers, whole number values. Niels Bohr was the one who figured out that that applies to electrons too. So if you take, if you picture taking a, a guitar string that's vibrating, instead of having two, the two ends fixed at both at either end of the guitar, you take them and connect them to each other. So you have a circle. If you can picture having that and causing a vibration on it, that's kind of the way that electrons behave. They don't exist in one particular spot. They exist as with a particular energy and with a particular vibration, more or less. Again, remember how I, I said we really don't have the firmware to explain these things or understand these things with a lot of specificity. Every single one of my analogies I'm going to use today fall apart if you look at it too closely. Um, I'll tell you where they fall apart usually. This is my area of expertise. Um, but I'm doing the best I can with our limited language and your limited math. Really, humanity's limited math because there are some things we can't explain um, using with the exact actual math. It doesn't exist yet or we have not discovered it yet. Um, and so Bohr was the one that said, okay, well, let's ju that just means that you can only have electrons at fixed energy levels. And that explains why you get very specific lines in specific places for different elements, which is kind of cool because the other cool aspect of this is means that if you take the light that something gives off and you run it through a prism, you're going to get something that looks kind of like a bar, a barcode in rainbow color. And the position of those lines, the wavelength of that light, will tell you what that substance was that, that emitted it. Right, so this is one of the ways that we know what the sun is made out of, despite the fact nobody's gone to the sun and taken a sample and brought it back. We can look at the light that's given off by the sun and say, well, the sun is mostly hydrogen and helium, just because we know it has wavelengths of light at specific energies. All right, and so, those energy levels, the other, when they first discovered this, they, they really did think about the um, electrons as existing as in sort of an orbit around the nucleus. Um, they don't actually vibrate up and down physically like this. They don't actually travel in a circle around the nucleus. Again, that's, we don't have the firmware to fully understand this. They exist in all places are um, simultaneously, but with a higher probability that they're in one spot than another, but they're really in all of them at the same time. The same way that the guitar strings vibration in real life looks like all of those waves overlap together. The behavior of, a, of an electron looks like all of those um, possible waves overlapping together. Nusa. But if you like stop time, would it be in one place or would it still be in like the field? So that gets to the heart of, of Schrodinger's cat. Until you measure it, it, is, it exists as that probability cloud. But the second you measure it, now you can say with greater detail where it is. But that actually gets to, here's what Heisenberg was actually famous for, right? Is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Which also, interestingly enough, it actually has some correlations with um, anthropology. But basically, the, the core of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is you can't measure a system without changing it. So has anybody ever seen the movie The Gods Must Be Crazy? If you haven't, it's free on YouTube. It's, from, it's a comedy about sub-Saharan Africa um, in the 80s and this, this tribe of, um, of I don't, we can't, they're hunter-gatherers, I guess, is the best way to describe it. 
um, from a tribe called the Tong. Um, that's literally what their name, what the name of their tribe is. They use clicks instead of a lot of vowel sounds. Um, um, they discover a glass Coca-Cola bottle and they've never seen anything like it before. And the act of finding that changes their whole society. Uh, it's a comedy, but it's also very, very good and very poignant. And um, But Heisenberg is the same general idea. You can't measure something without changing it. In the case of electrons, electrons are so small. If you try to measure where an electron is, that's a little bit like if you were standing blindfolded in the room um, and you were trying to measure where a baseball was that was hanging from a string in the middle of the room. And the only way you had of measuring it was by throwing golf balls and listening to the sound. That's basically what we do when we bounce light off of something and we see what color it turns. We're throwing photons at it to see what happens, see what changes. If you do that with a baseball and you hit it with a golf ball, you might be able to use your ears to say, oh, I know where the baseball was, not where it is anymore though, right? Because the act of measuring it with the golf ball made it move. So the same thing happens with electrons. If you measure where they are, the act of measuring them changes where they are going. Yeah. So if we had like a better like measuring apparatus, like theoretically, like if you stop time and then you blew it up, there would be still like points of the electron. Like if you if, if you were able like, to stop time and make it not behave like it was a quantum system by making it bigger, then yeah. yes, then it would behave like more like a regular system. So it is no, because if you if you if you take it and you make it stop behaving like it's a quantum system, then it's not an electron anymore. We we'd have to change everything about what an electron is to do that experiment the way you described it, and all of a sudden now quantum rules don't apply. Quantum rules only apply when things get below a certain size. If you make them bigger than that, they don't apply anymore. So the physics are just different. Physics are just different. So the the mathematical way of saying. The Heis what the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is, is that the, um, the uncertainty in position times the uncertainty in momentum must be greater than or equal to a constant called Planck's constant over two. Basically, if your uncertainty for position gets smaller, the uncertainty for your momentum gets bigger. In other words, when you measure where that baseball is by hitting it with a golf ball, you make it move faster. And now all of a sudden you don't know where it is now and you don't know what its momentum is, but you know where it was a second ago. You can't measure both at the same time, which is what leads to the, the classic science joke. Let's see if I can get all the parts of it right. Um, Heisenberg and Heisenberg is driving in a car and he get oh Heisenberg and Schrodinger Heisenberg and Schrodinger are driving in a car and they get pulled over by the police and the police officer looks at Heisenberg and says do you know how fast you're going and Heisenberg says no but I know exactly where I am um at which point the the cop gets suspicious and says I'm gonna need you to open the trunk of the car and he goes and he looks in the back of the car and says do you know you have a dead cat back here and Schrodinger says, well, I do now, asshole. Because <laughs> he wasn't dead. That's the other part of Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's cat is until you measure it, you don't know whether the cat's dead or alive. Oh. Schrodinger's cat is a thought experiment that says that if you have a closed box that has a cat in it, and there's also a, a poison that's set to be released at a random amount of time in, in the future, when you close it up, you don't know if, as soon as you close it up, you don't know if the cat's alive or dead. So according to quantum mechanics, that means the cat's both alive and dead simultaneously. Alive and dead are the two possible wave are the two possible frequencies. And until you measure it, it's both of them together. There's a the way we think about it in real life is we say there's a 50% chance the cat, cat's alive and a 50% chance the cat's dead. The math for quantum mechanics says really the cat is half alive and half dead. The last part of the joke is more for, for the physicists and usually involves um, having ohms in the in the car as well. Um, so if you've had physics, um, the the cop tries to tries to arrest them. Ohms resists. 
Ohms is the physicist that discovered electrical resistance, like we talked about for the superconductors earlier. You really need like a, an advanced degree to understand all the parts of that joke. Um, but it is kind of fun once you once you do get some of those inside jokes. Anyway, all right, we're almost done. So the last thing I want to look at is basically these lines correspond to the different types of vibrations that an electron can have. So with a guitar string, we can say, okay, it has no, no nodes versus it has one node in the middle and that then looks like this, or it has two nodes and it has three parts that are going up and down. Electrons, because they're more complicated systems and because we're dealing with them being very, very small, the functions that describe where you can find them, the functions that describe their vibrations are a little bit more complicated. Um, so basically what we get is a list of possible vibrations, a list of possible energies that an electron can have. And different electrons at different energy levels are going to have different properties. They're going to give off different colors when you, when you apply voltage to them. They're going to absorb light differently. They're going to react chemically in a different way. So everything about different elements that makes them distinct from each other comes from those protons stuck in the nucleus and the way that the electrons arrange themselves into these sequential le uh, levels. All right, the, the other last way I'm going to explain how this works is I'm going to go back to this figure. The different energy levels that they can exist in, it's like um, putting books in a bookshelf. You can't put a book on shelf one and a half, right? You can put a book on shelf one or shelf two. It can't be shelf one and a half. And if you're trying to fill it up in the most stable way, let's say you've got a bookshelf and it's not anchored to the wall and you're worried about earthquakes and it falling over. How do you fill it up? You fill it from the top up or top down or from the bottom up? Bottom up. Bottom up is from the lowest energy state to the highest energy state. You don't start putting things into the high energy states until everything below it's already filled. That's the same way that electrons work. We go to this. These are our possible bookshelves. Every one of these lines can hold two electrons. One that we usually draw is an arrow pointing upward and one is an arrow pointing downward but we always start from the bottom and work our way up, right? And the reason this winds up being very important is because this is where the periodic table gets its shape. Mendeleev figured out the, the law of periodicity, meaning that if you stack these things on top of each other, you get these repetitive patterns. This is the theory explaining why the periodic table is shaped the way it is because every row on the periodic table corresponds with one energy level. So the first energy level only has one shelf in it, shelf. The mathematical of the physics term is what we call an orbital. There's only one orbital associated with the first energy level. So it can only fit two electrons. Look on the first row of the periodic table. How many atoms or how many elements are in the first row of the periodic table? Hydrogen and helium, right? When you fill up helium, the second, uh, add the second electron to this first energy level, the next electron you add goes to the next energy level, to the second shelf. And the second shelf, the second row of the periodic table now has eight spots in it. It has eight different ways we can arrange the electrons at different, at di slightly different energies from each other. And if you look at the periodic table, the first two columns correspond with uh, what we call this, this lower energy shelf. It's like a, a subshelf, if we want to use that term, or a suborbital. You can fit two electrons in it, and then you can fit six electrons in the next level, in the next suborbital, which is why that next block of atoms on the periodic table is six elements across. And this is all sounding really, really confusing and you're not seeing the, um, the comparison yet. 
give me a, um, that's okay. We're gonna get lots of practice with this. Um, I just want to make the, the point that we fill these things up from the lowest energy to the highest energy. And that corresponds to add elect adding electrons into these specific energy levels. Now, how much of this have you heard before from, from your first year? Some, some of it maybe blocked out some of it and wish you didn't have to hear it again. I remember feeling that way about orbitals. Orbitals was the section when I was in Gen Chem that I just said, I'm gonna do well enough on the other parts of the test that I'm just gonna write off this section because it's confusing and I don't wanna think about it. Um, so I, there with you, it's, it is confusing, it's weird. Um, but we will practice with it because it turns out everything about the periodic table and the behavior of elements makes more sense if we spend the time to get at least a little bit of a handle on how this works. All right, so let's go ahead and pack up for today. We're not going to add or start working on writing these electron configurations yet. Thank you. I, I like covering this material.